This is Abe Freetanzer from CinemaDailyUS.com, and I'm so thrilled to be speaking with Jason Loftus, the filmmaker behind Eternal Spring. How are you, Jason? I'm doing great, Abe. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'm very uh, pleased to have had the chance to screen this film. It's definitely one of the most interesting and inventive films that I've seen this year. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We were trying to do some unique things with this one, uh, inspired on the artistic side and a very unique story. Well, let's start with your own relationship with Falun Gong, which am I pronouncing sure. that correctly? Yep, Falun Gong. Yeah, so I was, uh, I had an interest in sort of Eastern philosophy and meditation when I was in high school. So I explored different practices, was looking for different things. And I came across Falun Gong in 1998. And at that time, it looked to me like some kind of Chinese yoga, you know, these kind of slow moving exercises that we're used to seeing in sort of uh, parks and these kinds of things. And it had a had a philosophical component to it. It's based around these tenets of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. So my experience of it at that time, this is prior to there being any crackdown in China or any kind of political context, is this seems like a positive, benign thing. I uh, enjoy the exercises and feel like these values are something that are positive. A year later, the Chinese government bans it and says this is evil and dangerous and we need to get rid of it. And uh, I mean, at that time, as I mentioned, I'm young, I know very little about the political situation in China, but I just could not reconcile my own experiences personally with Falun Gong, which I found to be positive and the interactions I had with a community of people, mostly Chinese expats that were practicing it, and this narrative from China. And so I think this embedded for me a kind of interest in learning more about what was going on, how this thing, how this whole crackdown came about, and also a sympathy for people who I found, you know, they were coming out of China, they had endured persecution, they were, they felt they were misunderstood. And I could resonate with that because I had one experience of my encounters with them and it's something very different from what I was hearing from the Chinese narrative. I also recognize the Chinese narrative. It wasn't just an issue of misinformation or being misunderstood. It was this narrative that was underpinning these human rights abuses that they were facing. So I think this is what sort of sparked for me an interest in the subject matter. So flashing forward a little bit, we were making a Kung Fu video game a few years ago and it featured a lot of these we were looking for still illustrations. So like, uh, you know, comic type drawings for the a visual novel component of the game. And we learned about this artist who was living in New York. He was originally from China and he'd drawn for Justice League and Star Wars. And, and he'd worked with uh, Jin Yong, who's the leading Kung Fu novelist in China. So we just felt he had this amazing artistic ability and also, um, you know, the cultural background that would be perfect. And we brought him up to Toronto. We were working with him in our studio. And then we learned his story and how he had left China in the aftermath of this TV hijacking in Chongqing. I, I mentioned I had this kind of personal interest in the, in, the, in, the, you know, in the subject and a concern for the human rights situation. It also connected very much with my wife. My wife is from the same city as Dashong. She's from Chongqing, China, um, but she had a very different experience. She's not a Falun Gong practitioner. She, didn't, uh, she wasn't connected with any dissident or persecuted group. She's actually the daughter of a, a mid-level government official in China. So for her, hearing what was happening under her nose in her own hometown, it really hit home. And she, she felt, you know what, this is something that, uh, you know, the, the, the Falun Gong human rights situation deserves to be noticed. But this is also something that's just important for Chinese people. If this kind of thing, these abuses can happen under people's noses and we don't know about them and, and you know, we can't question it or this kind of thing. And, you know, people don't even hear about it. This is an issue for all of us. So she was adamant that this is a story we wanted to tell. I had my motivations as well for wanting to tell it. And then I think from an artistic standpoint, I felt it was really unique. You know, the animation has been used in documentary. I've seen it used very, really well. There's some great examples of that in recent years too. Um, but uh, I had always seen it just sort of as it's presented, it's there in the film, but we don't know who's making the animation, like what's the motivations behind it, what subjective elements are going into that artistic process. But with this film, we had an artist whose life, his events are totally, you know, his story is intertwined with these events, right? And he has all these mixed feelings. He's sympathetic of the efforts to counter the government narrative. But at the same time, he's also feel, he also feels like uh, maybe we were poking the bear. Maybe this was, you know, a miscalculation because the human cost was so heavy. And he felt it personally. He separated from his home. He'd been detained. He'd endured torture. All of that is wrapped up in this. And he wants to understand this event. He understands things best through his artistic process. And that's also how he communicates best. So for me, it was the opportunity to use animation in his style and make it, make it authentic, but also to demonstrate the artistic process playing out on screen, where we see Dashong processing all of this. We see him kind of exchanging and learning about this event and understanding it more and then drawing it and bringing it to life. And so we use our animation team to bring his sort of still 2D illustrations into you know, a 3D experience, but with that kind of 2D aesthetic and, and bring it to life in animation. 
Yeah, there's a really powerful moment uh, later on in the film where he basically, someone's describing something and he says, can I draw this as you're talking to me? And I think yes. when you're talking about bringing that in, that you're not just seeing the illustrations, you're seeing this is someone's way of expressing and also of reckoning in the same way that other yeah. films like Waltz with Bashir and Flea have yes. done, reckoning yes. with memory and figuring out a way to process it through through art. Exactly. Yeah, Waltz with Bashir was a big inspiration for me. I loved Flea. I didn't catch that one until... Uh, after I had finished my work on this film, because it's more recent, but uh, so I can't claim it as inspiration, but a film I loved, uh, even other films that use different methods, like Tower used a rotoscoping method a few years ago. There's a film I caught in Toronto, I think it was at TIFF, uh, 25 April, that was, you know, the Gallipoli sort of tragedy that had happened 100 years back, and it was using animation to bring to life the the stories in the journals of the, you know, of those who perished or those who survived. And I just felt, yeah, animation can be used very, very effectively. And this to me was just adding another dimension to that, the opportunity to see that process playing out. Because I feel as a storyteller, you never leave a subject the same way. If you're really deeply thinking about something and trying to understand what it is that resonates with you, why you feel a certain way, you never leave a project the same way as when you started. You kind of, you go through something yourself in that artistic process. And I felt this was an opportunity to kind of demonstrate that, to have an artist who's going through a process, let that play out on screen, capture his, you know, his, his sharings and his creative process and all of this and, and see how that evolves, helps to evolve his perspective on this event and how he looks at these people and how he looks at what happened, right? And I think art has the power to heal. It has the, the power to bring a catharsis and, and understanding. And, and I wanted to have that be an important part of the storytelling here in this film. I also think that we see, especially in some of the comics, you know, that he worked on, that there's a lot of violence and it's mm -hmm. often not the the seriousness and the emotional toll of it is not always uh, sort of processed. And so it's interesting to see here, see some of those this torture reenacted and you just really understand because of the way people are talking and the way it's being drawn, just how detrimental it could be and how it shouldn't just be sort of dismissed as something that happens in a comic or a video game. You know, it's an interesting point because, you know, Dashong brings up He's known for, you know, the Justice League comics and the Star Wars and the stuff he did with uh, with the, you know, the leading Kung Fu novelist in China. And there's some great work there, but it wasn't the superheroes that inspired him to get into into comics and into art. The Chinese comics, which he talks about in the film, were stories about real life figures in Chinese history. But these were figures who had demonstrated amazing values, essentially, like they're kind of like quintessential examples of these foundational Chinese values. So like, uh, you know, UFA, which he alludes to, in the, or he mentions in the film, you know, he had endured un unimaginable kind of things because of his, you know, unwavering loyalty to his homeland, right? And so he's this example that people think of in China when they think of loyalty, right? And there are other kind of characters who demonstrate other values. And these are the people, these are the stories that really resonated with him. It was the real world heroes. It was depicting those. And that's what inspired him is just, of course, that's not the work you get when you're working with, uh, you know, DC Comics or whatever. These are not the things that you're assigned to do. So he rose in prominence in the com comic space, but I think he always wanted to really gravitate towards these real life heroes, these real life stories, because that's what had resonated with him. And it was interesting, you know, we asked him early on in the interview process, you know, what was it that got him into comics? And that's where we learned about this inspiration. And then as we work through this film and we, we work through his story and we're talking with him, we see him start to change how he talks about these individuals who are involved in this film. He has mixed feelings at the beginning, but he starts to recognize them more as kind of modern day examples of these people who had inspired him. And then I think he starts to see his own roles. Like, because a lot of people, when you go through trauma and when you experience tragedy and people around you do not survive and you do, there's, there's quite often it's easy to have this survivor's guilt. Of, you know, how come I survived and other people didn't? And I think for him, it helped to be able to tell their story. And, you know, their their voices were snuffed out. They weren't able to carry on their message, but he feels he's able to carry that torch and through his artwork, bring them to life in a certain in way and be able to carry on their message. And I think that helps him to deal with this, this, this guilt or this feeling of like, he's alive, but they aren't, right? Because he's still able to help them carry on their message. So I've seen what the process meant for him. And then I've seen even after the film is finished and we're sharing it with people, you know, it's it's very it's very prevalent, like what this means to him, because he sees other people resonating with his work and his story and his process, but also with these individuals who didn't survive. People he knows, friends around him that didn't survive, they see people, he sees people connecting with their story and he feels now he's carrying on their effort. Were there any challenges that you encountered with uh, using animation that you might not have expected? 
Yeah, I think it's the biggest thing. Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, one is, um, you know, it we benefited from having a close collaboration with Dashong already on the video game because, you know, Dashong is from Changchun. He's he's able to conjure the feeling of the city. For him, it's not just the landmarks, which you can find reference to online. You can find photos of what the city looks like. Um, but for him, it's this feeling and the vibe and the soul of the city. And, you know, and it comes down to even like how the people in the city behave, you know, how with mannerisms, they have all this type of stuff. That was something that he knows, but he's just drawing these still illustrations and other people are, are bringing them to life in animation, right? And so this is something that required kind of communication. There's language barriers, there's cultural barriers, but I think that's something that took a process so that, you know, he could watch it and feel, yeah, this feels like my city. And, you know, we've seen other people who are in the audience uh, that we didn't meet before the screenings, but there was a lady from Changchun in the Netherlands when we were screening at Movies That Matter. And, you know, she was in tears throughout the film and we learned later, spoke with her and she knew the individuals in the film personally very well. And she said she felt like she had met them again, not just that their their story was depicted on screen, but she really felt she had met and connected with them. And I think that's a, a sort of a testament to this process that happened through the animation to try and maintain this feeling and authenticity of the, you know, of the story and of the environment in the city. Uh, I mean, the other challenge from an artistic standpoint was really just that we were trying to do two different things at once that are usually at odds with each other. So you see, you see animated films and then you see traditional documentaries that are shot in live action. And typically when you're doing a traditional documentary, you might go out and shoot 100 hours of footage and you're sitting in the editing suite and you carve it up and the story kind of emerges organically. The difference with animation is that you typically lock everything in advance. You're going to have, you know, your script is locked, your storyboards are all figured out. You build an animatic or a Leica reel, which is kind of like, you know, shot by shot timing is figured out before you begin doing animation. And you'll lock your, your sort of radio edit, all the audio and stuff as well. So that's typically the way that you would go about animation because it's very time consuming and expensive. And especially for like a smaller independent studio, we don't have the resources oftentimes that the, the big, you know, animation studios do. So there's this risk if you're like animating things, which I mean, by virtue of the fact that we wanted to have the traditional documentary, we wanted to shoot Dashon, we wanted to watch and monitor, like observe his process as he's kind of exchanging with these other survivors and, and how he's translating that into his art. That, that meant that we were still doing this kind of traditional documentary and letting the story kind of take shape naturally as we were editing it. But at the same time, we wanted him to be sharing his work, his animation. We wanted him to be animating things and, and, and all of that. So this meant we were doing both at the same time. We're animating scenes. We don't know where they're gonna fit in the film. We don't know how we're gonna transition from one to the next. We're not 100% sure they're actually gonna end up in the film. And that's a bit of a risk, right? Um, but I think it's because of that leap that we took in this process, we benefited from kind of having a very small team, but like chipping away at it over a longer period of time that gave us a little bit more of a buffer to play with this. I mean, we, we spent almost six years, but we were working on other projects as well to keep things moving. Um, but that time and that small team allowed us to kind of chip away and figure it out. And fortunately, I think just a gut instinct that somehow these two different processes that are typically at odds would somehow gel and give us something unique. And, and hopefully in the end, it feels like it's all cohesive and it works. I think it does, absolutely. And can you share some of the obstacles you face just in terms of China's uh, involvement in or, you know, attempts to, to uh, intimidate and just any other pressure that you may have felt that made it seem like this might not have been made? Yeah, so it, it's um, you get into this, you understand the story is sensitive. But I think the Falun Gong subject is among the most sensitive things that you could uh, approach in China. It's been a, a taboo subject for sure. So you, you go into it wide eyed, but the, the video game that we were making with Dashong was um, called Shuyan Saga, and it was being published by Tencent, which is a major media company in China. And in the midst of making this film and one other related project that was kind of proceeding in the middle of this film, uh, our game was being published and it was up on the storefronts. It was splashed all over the homepage on Tencent's Wii game platform, and then it disappears. And when we reached our representative at Tencent, we're told um, the Chinese government had visited them and told them they had to cut ties with my company. They said, it's not an issue of the game. The game had been approved by the censorship departments in two different ministries of the Chinese government. They'd walked us through that whole process at Tencent. Everything should, be, should have been fine, but it's an issue of me and my company. And then I'm asked, are you doing something not aligned with the Chinese government direction? At the same time, my wife's family members who are still in Changchun in Northeast China, uh, they're contacted and harassed by the public security bureau there, and they're told that we know what you're up to overseas, basically saying they know who our family is, they know what we're doing. They don't tell you exactly what it is they're doing. They typically won't tell you like, oh, okay, just don't do this. As long as you don't do this, you'll be fine. They're never specific. 
because mm -hmm. it's actually not as effective for self-censorship. But they just say, we know what you're doing. It's like, well, what do they know? Well, should I be doing this? There might be 10 other things they might not like. What should I, you know, and this kind of makes this self-censorship more effective. So, you know, you hear about the influence that China wields in Hollywood. You know that there are certain stories that don't get touched perhaps because, you know, we want to maintain access to that market. You speak as well with like journalists who, uh, you know, in many cases, brave people who are trying to get to the bottom of stories. But these news bureaus exist in China, the Western news outlets, because they provide a steady flow of information, you know, and that's their whole model. That's why, you know, we pick up the news. We expect to know what's going on in the world. That's how the, the, you know, the whole model works. And that's that's how they get to stay in operation. So if they're going to get to the bottom of one super sensitive human rights issue and dig into it and they risk having their bureau closed or being labeled as anti-China and like losing their access and abilities, that's a threat to them that they can't take either. So there are reasons why these subjects can't be uh, approached very easily. And I understand that. And it really hit home for me when this happened. And I totally get why people make that decision. And they, you know, they say, hey, it's not worth it. Someone else will cover this story. But at the same time, I didn't feel that that excuse would really work because for one, you know, so much time goes by and people don't tell these stories. It's like, if you don't tell it, who's going to be the one that tells it for one, right? And at the same time, I build a relationship with Dashong. I personally know what he's been through. There's other survivors who've been through just hell to be able to tell their stories and some people who did not survive to be able to tell their stories. So you kind of feel like, you know, you're in, you're entrusted with a certain, to a certain extent of, you know, they've gone through all of this. They adamantly want to tell their story. It's a very, um, it's a compelling story. Like from a filmmaking perspective, there's not a reason not to tell it. It's really just an issue of like, what kind of consequences is this going to create, right? And so I feel it's important. For me, I just felt we had to tell this story. It's not just me. Other people face a lot more risks than myself. Like I mentioned, my wife, she doesn't have a vested interest in it because you know she doesn't practice Falun Gong. She has family members still in China. The other survivors still have connections in China. Maybe they wanted to return at some point, uh, you know. But they all, everyone who appeared on screen was people were people who adamantly wanted to tell their stories, and and so I really respect that. And I feel like it's important when you have that to then be able to give people that voice because you know we talk about the freedoms that we have. Hey, we have freedom of speech. We have freedom of religion. We have freedom of belief. But when people come to us and they've gone through so much to be able to tell their stories, and if we make a calculation that, well, we can't help you tell that story because of the consequences, then do we really have that freedom? We're essentially importing the uh, the censorship that people are subject to in, in China. So I, I feel it's important that we uh, we help to give a voice. And I'm happy to see that there's a sort of global reach to this film now that it's been selected by Canada as the official Oscar entry, which is exciting. It's also a bit strange in some way because it's not a film that takes, you know, it's not a film about Canada and it's, you know, <laughs> but... I, I think it's it's exciting. Can you share your, your feelings on that? Yeah, actually, I think on that point, I think it really highlights uh, a level of diversity that we haven't seen represented in Canada because it is the first Mandarin language film and there are many talented Chinese Canadians, uh, you know, many creative people, artists, others who, and also people who carry with them when they come to Canada, these remarkable, harrowing and sometimes traumatic stories. And so the ability to reflect those on screen is, is I think, a wonderful thing that hasn't been reflected. I also feel it's the first documentary and the first animated film that's ever been selected. So these are other sectors in Canada where we have remarkable talent and uh, previously haven't been able to, you know, they haven't had the spotlight in the same way. So I, I hope that it's a recognition, not just of this film, but of a, a broader industry in Canada that uh, has a lot of talent. And we're, you know, we're proud to represent that, um, you know, for the first little bit, obviously, it's like when you get this news, it's, it's uh, very humbling. And, you know, um, but then you quickly recognize as well that, hey, you're representing Canada. So you want to do your very best to represent. You want to do your best to, to speak about the film, to share the film broadly. And fortunately, what this does is it it shines a new a new spotlight on the film, you know, and and allows more people to to be exposed to, you know, to the story that we cared so much about sharing as well. So it's a wonderful opportunity and, and we're going to do everything we can to, uh, you know, to represent Canada as best we can. Great. And what are you working on next? Uh, well, I'll have to be, <laughs> this is, uh, this is consuming a good amount of my time currently. We're, we're releasing theatrically in, uh, nine countries. Uh, we're still on a festival circuit all over the place. And then the awards uh, campaign is quite intensive. I'm learning the effort that goes into doing this is, is quite all consuming, but there are projects we already had underway that we're still continuing with. So, uh, I'm, I'm like, when we got the news on the, uh, the Academy Award selection from Canada, I actually, you know, there's so many great French Canadian uh, filmmakers that I, I, that usually are up for this honor that I didn't actually anticipate the call. So I hadn't cleared my schedule. I was 
working with the lead actress on our upcoming uh, video game. It's a sci-fi uh, video game, a narrative game. And uh, when the call came in, and so we're working on that. We're working on a related uh, short form animated series in the sci-fi genre as well. Uh, working on some VR projects, a kind of spoken word experience in the VR space, and as well one human, ra human rights uh, VR film that's related to the Eternal Spring world. So there's still some human rights work, but a variety of things. And I think it's kind of a reflection of uh, maybe uh, attention deficit issues that I have <laughs> in terms of these different mediums. But um, we really enjoy in our group working across different mediums. I find every time you work across a medium, you kind of build uh, you build your tool set, you build solutions that sometimes you don't think of in film. You know, people have watched this film and said, oh, I really appreciated the video game aesthetic you had in there. And it took me a while to kind of figure out what they were talking about. Like where I never consciously thought of a video game when I was making this. But I think there's always sort of invisible elements that you just take with you. Um, you know, we had a lot of Chinese characters, uh, you know, subjects in this film. And for a Western audience, sometimes it can be difficult to keep straight who's who, you know, the names are, are difficult sometimes. So we ended up using these little icons that pop up with a name, you know, and it, in, in some senses, maybe it looks a bit like a visual novel or a game where you have different characters pop up and, you know, their speech bubbles and stuff. And I was like, okay, you know what, maybe not, not consciously, but subconsciously you work in a different medium and it gives you a solution to a problem. And you don't make these compartments where it's like, oh, I only touch this if I'm making a game or I only touch this. It just sort of broadens your experience and the tool set that you have to, to do things. So um, perhaps that's where it comes from. So we're gonna continue to work across, you know, different, uh, different mediums and definitely door open to another feature, but there isn't one that's coming immediately on the heels of this one. We're working across a few different projects right now. Awesome. Well, for more great conversations like this, you can subscribe to the Cinema Daily US YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Jason, for speaking with me and good luck with everything that's coming next. Thanks, Abe. It was a great conversation. Really enjoyed speaking with you and uh, thanks for the time.